SCP-245, SCP-RPG. SCP documents can come in a wide variety of styles. Some are short, some are lengthy, some are mostly interviews or exploration logs, some are more akin to tales, and some break the format entirely, such as SCP-245. 245 takes the form of a video game, making it incredibly unique among the thousands of other SCPs. That also means that this is going to be a bit of a unique video, as instead of exploring a simple document, I'll have to delve into a game. When you first look at 245, you see that the game itself is referred to as 245-1, and must be monitored and completed on a regular basis to ensure containment. It also mentions that the game world might sporadically change, and that the master password should not be revealed to any entity encountered in the game. We're given a download link for the game, and a password protected link to access SCP-245-1. Dash A. We'll get to that later, but let's dive in. Booting up the game, we're given the options of disconnecting or creating a new user. Obviously, we're a new user, so we put in a username, and we're given a generic access token, since the game can't seem to access an existing list of users. This generic access token allows us to access SCP-245's containment files, and upon opening them, we see the game world as a blue-haired individual speaks to us. This individual, who is given the name Billy Stafford, says that someone was supposed to log in and help him root around for problems in the game files. He assumes that is us, but it seems our character can't speak, so Billy generates dialogue options for us to select. He notices that we're using a generic access token, and asks which of three sites with access to this file we're working from. Obviously, we're not actually at any of those sites, as we're not actually a Foundation employee, but the choice is irrelevant. Billy says that we're not allowed to do any external modifications to this game file, such as just rewriting code, but they still have to fix some problems. Fortunately, there are some backdoor protocols built into the game system that Billy can access to fix some things. He notes that if we're really lucky, we won't run into SCP-245 while working. He says that SCP-245 can't be described outside of a game environment, and if it is, some sort of end-of-the-world scenario will occur. This entity is contained within this game, and so if there are problems with the game, there are problems with the containment. Billy assures us that there won't be any issues, as he's done this before. He even claims to have finished the game a couple of times, although when he last played, the game started differently. We're given control of our character now, as we make our way towards the town. On the next screen, we stand on the edge of some sort of precipice, and text suddenly scrolls past, reading, SCP RPG, a story that could be true. Billy notices it and says we should go, as who knows what else 245 has slipped in here. Arriving in town, we follow Billy into the nearby admin control room, which is curiously just another building in the town. In the control room, we see a number of terminals lined up, along with a series of game characters against the wall. Billy tells us to look at some of the terminals while he works. Some of the terminals in front of the characters allow for debug options, allowing you to instantly complete certain quests associated with the characters. Some of the others are more faulty, with the terminal for the final boss stating that the final boss wishes for death, and there are no edits needed. The primary quest giver is apparently corrupted as well. If we access the laptop in the corner though, we're finally given a snippet of a proper description of 245. As Billy said, 245 is an entity which can't be safely described outside of a working video game. And I suppose the key word there is working, in this case. As the description goes on and is about to tell us what happens when you break this rule, Billy interrupts us to say that he's finished here, and he's just going to go along to the other control room without us. The laptop now only reads, data corrupted, so let's move on. Poking around the town, we see that everything is fairly desolate. 
There are large cracks in the walls, rubble strewn about, and holes scattered around the ground. Heading into the various buildings, we see the different non-playable characters that were in the control room. The woman running the inn tells us that no one has come out of the wastes in years, and proceeds to tell us that her husband went out looking for water a few years ago, and never came back. In another building, we meet a grandmother, who tells us that her grandson went playing outside the walls and hasn't come back. In what seems like a temple, we meet an elderly man, who immediately asks if we're here to kill him. Apparently, that's what was supposed to happen in the story, as he is the villain of that story. He ascends to godhood halfway through the story, but he's meant to die. Then he says that someone came here and corrupted everything and now he'll never let him die. He begs you to kill him, but there doesn't seem to be a way to do so. In yet another building, we meet a young man who asks us to go outside town and kill the sand monsters in the desert. His father was killed trying to do so, but we look like we can handle ourselves, apparently. And if we kill five of them and bring him their animating gems, he'll give us a map to the bandit camp. Since the bandits have kidnapped the king's daughter, there's likely a reward in store for rescuing her. Let's check in with the king then, who's in the palace in town. The king, however, is the primary quest giver, and is corrupted. In this context, that means that, much like the man in the temple, he has gained awareness of his existence. He says that he's supposed to tell you that a bandit ran off with his daughter, and if we're a real person, to just get it over with and turn the game back off. He says that he doesn't want to think about a story that only may be true, referencing that text that scrolled past before. Done with the town for now, let's head back out into the desert. In typical RPG fashion, wandering the area outside of town puts us into random battles with sand golems. Fortunately, they are pushovers, as one hit from us will allow us to grab their animating crystal and end the fight. If we return to the young man with five of the crystals, he thanks us and gives us the map. However, there are still sand golems out there, and he asks if the attacks are ever going to stop. If we kill ten of the sand golems though, it seems that we have committed digital genocide, as it puts a stop to all the attacks. In the corner of the desert, we find a rope leading down into a pit. In the pit, we find the body of the grandson, stripped to the bone by the sands. We can take the skeleton with us, and we can return it to the grandmother, but she is of course devastated. Returning to the building, we find that the grandmother died in her sleep while holding on to her grandson's doll. Fairly tragic, but we can break the game a little to make things better. If we instead take the boy's skeleton to the control room, we can use the terminal to return him to life. Doing this, the grandmother berates the boy, profusely thanks you, and says that one day you'll need her help, and she'll be ready. Much better. Now that we have the bandit map, if we talk to the king, he tells us to go finish it, and we end up in the bandit camp. Entering the first tent, we see a crack in the cloth interior, and tear it open to reveal the second control room. Billy asks us how we're liking the game so far, but then remembers we can't speak. We see a few more terminals related to characters, and another laptop. We get some more info about the SCP, as this game was specifically created for the containment of 245. The game must be regularly maintained, as 245 is capable of gradually modifying the game to the point of breaching containment, although what that exactly entails is still unknown. Billy heads off to the last control room, and we move on. In the second tent, we find the female bandit leader, who informs you that the bandits are running out of water. She's found an old map to an oasis, and if we'll agree to go out and confirm its existence, she'll convince her second-in-command to go speak to the king. It seems that the princess and her second-in-command fell in love, and were married. Of course, we agree, and immediately head to the oasis. There we find another body, this one with a journal. This is the innkeeper's lost husband, who died next to the water. You take his journal with you, and return to the bandit leader. 
She's glad to hear that there's water, and tells us the second-in-command agreed to go back to town with us. We find the princess sleeping on his bed, and the man tells us that he hopes we're right about her father, otherwise he's a dead man. This takes us back to town, where we can return the journal to the innkeeper. She recognizes her husband's handwriting, and says that everything happens for a reason. She says she'll be fine, but to just give her some time. Talking to the king, he says that he's now supposed to tell us about a dark force lurking in a nearby pyramid, but it isn't true. None of this is true, and we should just turn off the game to let him rest. Billy then shows up and tells the king to shut up. Billy says that the last control room is in that pyramid, and asks if we're ready to go. We are. With nothing left to do but ascend the pyramid, we climb the steps. Billy appears behind us and tells us this is our last stop. He says that he hasn't been completely upfront with us, because it's difficult to get people to play his game. He then proceeds to push us into the hole at the top. Inside the pyramid, we find a modern interior, and Billy tells us that he changed it because a ruined pyramid wasn't his style. He's apparently checked the Foundation's personnel files and found no record of us, so he deduces that we're a civilian. He's running a trace and going to put the results in the security breach file. Obviously, there is no such person as Billy Stafford. This is SCP-245. As we move through the pyramid, it continues to talk to us, telling us that it used to live inside any form of writing, from cave drawings, to ancient graffiti, to poetry, and its favorite, interactive media. 245 says that the creator of this game tried to focus the story around Ozymandias, a poem about the hubris of man and the impermanence of their accomplishments. 245 changed it, however, favoring instead another poem titled A Story That Could Be True by William Stafford which is more about imagination and limitless possibilities. 245 knows that we aren't going to stop our efforts, so it invites us to finish things. In the final control room, 245 tells us that it is a god here, and there's nothing we can do to stop it. The man from the temple and the king suddenly appear, however, having been given awareness of their existence. They hope that by killing 245, they can reverse things to normal in the game world. 245 shows its true self, a Final Fantasy-esque monster, and we enter into battle with it. It launches a number of powerful attacks at us, but each one is deflected in turn by the various NPCs that we've assisted along the way, in true RPG fashion. We then enter actual combat with it, although 245 turns out to be quite a pushover, barely harming us as we beat on it. Before long, we are victorious, and the credits quickly roll. Unfortunately, after the credits, we are in a strange room with 245, who says that it's done nothing wrong, and the Foundation just stuck it in here. If we just walk away now and close the game, the Foundation will never be the wiser. We could do that, or we can access the terminal in this room, punching in the master password to the game world. I'll get to how we learned it in a minute, but let's put it in. After doing so, we're given the option of deleting all files related to 245. Of course, 245 tells us that it is hardly the only copy of 245, and even if we delete this one, it will never die. In the end, its kind will continue to live in fiction, and will outlive us. It doesn't have to beat us, it just has to be. After the system purge is completed, 245 is still standing in front of us, and explains that this was all over after it went into the first control room. Everything after that was just us playing into its hands, so that we would supply the master password. You may recall in the containment protocols at the start, it said to never reveal the password to any in-game entity. Now that it has master file access, it disconnects us and presumably we really screwed over things. Okay, well, let's try some other things. If you don't manage to properly help all the NPCs during your playthrough, which is likely the first time, 
you are instead defeated during the confrontation with 245. We get sent to a different area with the princess on a platform, who apparently has spoken to a number of researchers who have failed the game. When the game was first created, she was the MacGuffin, the main trigger for the plot. She says that for 245 though, this isn't a game, it's reality. It puts some of itself into some of the NPCs, causing them to believe that this is their reality as well. The princess believes that 245 just doesn't want to be alone. To end this horrible existence for the game characters, we have to get into the planning documents in 245's article. Remember way back at the start, when there was a password protected link on the article? We now have that password. Welcome to Corneria. Using that password, we get to access the file, SCP-245-1-A. In there, we get a look at the original map of the town for the game, which is far larger and intact, showing how much 245 has changed the game world. In the original plot, the protagonist confronts the antagonist, the man in the temple, at the pyramid after completing all the side quests. It also mentions that after the credits run, a full description of 245 will be displayed, but we definitely didn't get that, as 245 changed things. We're also given the master password here, Large Cosmic Laos. 245 told us at the end that it was all over for us as soon as he made it to the first control room. So what would happen if it didn't? Starting the game over, when you first arrive in town with 245, if you run ahead of it and enter the control room first, you have the option of locking it out. You can access the main terminal yourself, instantly using it to complete all the quests in the town. You can then teleport right to the second control room and use that terminal to complete the other quests. You can also activate an encounter in which you fight the digital version of Dr. Samarian the in-universe avatar of the author of SCP-245. Teleporting again to the third control room, you can access a rudimentary start to a game, apparently created by SCP-245. More importantly, you can teleport to the fourth control room, without 245 present. Here, if you put in the master password, you can access the full description of 245, finally. Basically, 245 can only be described through interactive fiction, and it itself exists as various independent characters within interactive fiction. Right now, the only game that exists which contains 245 is this one, which is securely contained on Foundation computers, never minding the fact that we accessed it. It was originally found by the Foundation in a branching plot novel, where it was capable of altering the narrative and Foundation researchers were unable to describe 245, as it can only be described through interactive fiction. They went on to make this game to contain it and describe it, although 245 believes that it can affect objects outside of the game. Most importantly, however, it says that although 245 can access documents associated with it in a limited way, 245 is entirely harmless. So, all that talk about 245 ending the world and things like that was just nonsense on 245's part. It seems to honestly believe that it could do these things, but the Foundation considers it utterly harmless. What we're doing right now is exactly what the containment protocols demand, deleting all of these modifications that 245 has made to this little game world and restoring things back to the default state. 245 will continue to believe that this game is its reality, and continue to modify it, partly with the goal of escaping, and partly due to loneliness, as the princess said. The Foundation has this sentient entity utterly contained in a prison it can never escape from, and it presents no real danger to the world. We delete the modified files, restore the original, and disconnect. Life goes on. There is one other ending, which has no bearing on the story of 245, but I'll mention here for completeness sake. If during the battle with 245 after successfully completing all the quests, 
you purposefully lose by guarding over and over, you get the last ending. Here, 245 realizes that we must have played this before and wanted to see what would happen, and says that nothing here matters as we'll just restart and start a fresh game. We disconnect, and that's that. SCP-245 is an utterly unique SCP, and really a testament to the ingenuity of SCP authors. It's not an earth-shattering monster, or an imminent threat to the state of the world, or anything like that, but it's pretty much everything you'd want from an entity that lives inside of video games. Dr. Samarian did a great job of not only creating an SCP inside of a video game, but also creating just a good SCP. It's touching, and a bit sad, that the game was designed around Ozymandias, and the futility of life's efforts, whereas 245 wanted it to be about a story that could be true, about the possibilities of life. In some ways, perhaps we're all a bit like 245.